So I think the first question to the three of you is, what is this building's future? This is, a, this is a conservation project. Um, there is no refurbishment as such or anything new to be adding except for a couple of windows that we needed to replace or parts of the windows and one window, complete window, on the chancel. The first thing to do was to carefully look at the building from the ground using binoculars and be systematic about it. So elevation by elevation, we would um, have drawings in front of us, if you're lucky, <laughs> in this case we did have drawings, and then mark on those drawings, stone by stone, preferably, uh, the damage that we think has occurred. So that can inform um, process as to how to repair. The moisture getting to the iron cramps, you can see them here. So um, we would now cut out about that much, um, pull the damaged stone out, treat the cramp. So clean the cramp as much as we can and then treat it and then insert a new piece of stone in correct mortar. So lime mortars, always lime mortars because they allow a building to breathe. And the more we allow a building to breathe, the more it can come in and come out. If you use hard mortars, like cement mortars, once the moisture gets in, it can't get out very easily and the damage is then worse because we're not allowing building to do what it's meant to do. It became pretty obvious that the building was in desperate need with sort of typical uh, problems with buildings of this type, not just churches, but buildings with ashlar stones um, suffer and that is uh, where cramps which are holding the ashlars in place um, normally at a time where you they use iron if the water gets to them they rust and they basically blow the stone and it was pretty obvious even from the ground this building was really suffering from this sort of damage and um, some of it was becoming dangerous because um, the stones can um, become loose and simply fall so it really did need um, desperately uh, some work done um, and um, this building just was a typical example of what can go wrong. Mm -hmm.
Ian Angus of Cardin and Godfrey Architects, and I'm the inspecting architect for St. Mary's Church. Apart from the wonderful lightness of this interior, the first thing, the first thing that one notices in the architecture, in the traditional architecture, is the Corinthian order of the arcade columns. The Corinthian order, which is not specific to interior use, but is particularly specific to the use of the support of arches, as opposed to flat beams or trabriated construction. Um, my name is Neil McLaughlin and I'm an architect. The two most spectacular objects, I would say, are the organ, which is behind the doorway as you come in beneath the gallery, and by far the finest piece of furniture in the building is this rather glorious pulpit which has got a very kind of jaunty and uh, cheerful air about it. It's very delicate, much lighter in terms of its detailing than any of the other architecture. And it has a playfulness to it that I really enjoy. Looking at it, it appears to be supported by palm trees and a rather sort of far eastern appearance to the canopy, to the sounding board overhead. So it brings a real whiff of the exotic into this rather plain 18th century English church. Hi, I'm Mark Chapman, Vice Principal at Ripon College Cudston and Professor of the History of Modern Theology at Oxford University. So I'm now upstairs in the gallery, uh, which I imagine was reserved for all the poorer people of the parish. Uh, the wealthier people would have had their pews downstairs uh, with cushions and upstairs here we have some very hard benches uh, and I imagine they would have been fairly cramped as well. Uh, and what you can't do very here is to see a great deal about what's going on, but the preacher uh, can see absolutely everybody. Uh, and one would imagine that uh, families would come together, uh, they would sit downstairs and their servants would all come upstairs, family by family, uh, household by household, and they would occupy the pews up here. Uh, and there was a sense in which the preacher could keep an eye on everybody. Uh, because the only place you can see every single pew in the church uh, is the pulpit. So now we're looking, looking at the chancel and I think it's noticeable how wide this chancel is and comparatively how deep it is in the tradition as is sometimes used the expression of a, of a preaching box where the, the word is as important or perhaps more important in some cases than the Eucharistic sacrament or the central axis of the high altar or of the altar at all. One reason why the chancel is the way it is is that the original brief for, to Thomas Hardwick was to extend and adapt the existing church, the early church, to accommodate more people. And his, his first design was to produce a new nave, a larger nave, but to attach it to the existing chancel. So as an architect, I'm looking at this rather strange anomaly. The architecture of the building is axial. It's got a biaxial symmetry. You come in the front door, you have a row of fine columns which lead you up to this archway, at the end of which there's a stained glass window, the figure of Christ carrying the cross, and beneath it, the altar for the Eucharist. That has to be architecturally the dominant focus of the church. But then there's this other thing which is tugging you away from that. This huge piece of furniture with all of its gaudy decorations and the sort of substructures and tiers which are no, no, no longer there, which is providing a completely rival point of focus. And I think that's very interesting. It's looking at an historical moment when the well-established traditions of where things should be have not yet fully been worked out. And the tension between those two, what the architecture is telling you you should look at, and what the um, elaboration of the internal furnishings and the actual liturgy are telling you should look at are tugging in two slightly different directions. One of the great glories of St Mary's is the pews, the oak pews down in the main space here, all designed integrally um, within the interior by Thomas Hardwick um, and scribed to the, uh, to the Corinthian columns neatly, beautifully scribed in proportion with the width, the slender width of those columns um, to enclose the galleries. And the galleries themselves contain benches, lesser benches made of pine, um, in order to, to cram in as many people as possible. I mean, like most churches of the time, uh, pews were rented 
which meant that the wealthier people had the best pews uh, and they would be unlocked uh, by the keeper of the pews uh, so he would only open them to people who paid for them on their annual rental which would mean quite often you'd find some people wouldn't be in church on a Sunday morning that the pews would be empty but other people would be forced to sit upstairs uh, rather than in the comfortable pews uh, because uh, the, um, they, uh, yeah, the pews weren't occupied. Uh, it was only in mid-Victorian times when they wanted to do away with social hierarchy in church, uh, but keep it in the rest of society, that they began to uh, get rid of uh, rented pews, or box pews as they're often called. But they're boxes because they have doors, and those doors are only unlocked by the people who've paid for, uh, for the people who've paid for them. It seems to me that um, it supports some sense of prayerfulness, of reminding oneself of who one is in relation to the wider creation. But it all is, is also asking questions about that creation as well, about what kind of order do we impose and what are the principles that we've, we use to do that. This might become a place that allows that to happen because of its sense of order and purpose and through debate and dialogue and critique and criticism the great principles of the Enlightenment that are embodied here, uh, it might allow us to do something along those lines. Repair and conservation is not the enemy of change, and conservation relies on good design just as new buildings and new fittings rely on good design. To understand more about Thomas Hardwick's thinking when he produced the designs for St Mary's, we decided to talk to the architect of a very recent church building the Edward King Chapel at Ripon College, Cudston, about the processes the architect, Neil McLaughlin, employed. In July 2019, some of our parishioners visited the Edward King Chapel at Cudston. At that stage, in a way, I had really no ideas. I'd come to the site in a very open way. When we came in, Lister Tong gave us the verbal introduction. And he had written a brief, and it was really extraordinary for an architect's brief, which can be very, in a sense, matter of fact. The first clue as to what we were going to do was that Lister was speaking, and he was describing to the architects, I think some of whom knew more about liturgical space than others, he was describing to the architects um, the, the principle of a collegiate type of chapel, which is, in a sense, antiphonal. Uh, it's based on what might have been the older choirs of cathedrals um, where the congregation are facing each other across the space um, and they can pray back and forth. And so he was describing that as a concept. And just as I'm doing now, he was holding out his hands to talk about that concept. And then he paused and said, oh, we'd like a greater sense of community. And as he paused, his hands just started to cup like that. And I thought, there's an architectural plan. So when we entered the architectural competition, we actually took a photograph of a pair of hands. I still have a photograph, a photograph of a pair of hands clasped like that. The idea that the sort of endless and open and indeterminate space of the two parallel lines just curves around to create um, a sense, of, a sense of, 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 of gathering together. Well, we wanted it to be a place of prayer, a place where people could find God within it somehow and be able to easily relate to God. We all decided that after our chapel in Windsor, which was a very good example of Victorian architecture for a chapel, um, was so ornate we wanted something fairly plain as a contrast because nothing could come up to the other one so we didn't want anything to try. It was lovely to walk in and see the light on the wall um, the, the different prism coming from the windows which I gather was accidental and the other thing I really enjoyed was as the service went on to see the outside world 
So being able to look to the altar and then seeing trees beyond. I mean, inevitably, uh, when we were thinking about building up the brief, we had to think about what kind of furnishing we would have and how flexible and adaptable the space uh, needed to be. Uh, so we wanted a, a fairly large interior space, but we wanted the seats to be focused and to be fixed so that there would be that place that it is built for worship. It's not built for the lecture hall, an extra lecture hall, or a, a place where you can show films or have concerts. Uh, uh, you might be able to do those things as well, but the fundamental principle of the church, the chapel, uh, is for worship, and a particular type of worship as well. And I think um, uh, we, uh, we ummed and ahed a bit and we debated quite a lot about whether to have fixed seating or whether to have movable seating. Uh, but the nature of the chapel having a sense of being built into the ground as well. There's that very sense in which it becomes the um, one of the images that was used in the design was the, the idea of the navel, the centre uh, of the college was below ground almost. So it's dug into the ground. Uh, and that that gave it a sense of fixity uh, and it was that that sort of gave us the idea that the seating uh, needed to be focused around the centre, the word and the sacrament, the, uh, the centre of the college with the seating fixed around that. Um, and in practice uh, nobody's really missed the idea of it not being a flexible space. Uh, you can't miss something you've never had. I've never actually been into a chapel before and been thought, why, really, in the way I am now? And I'm thinking, why is it that shape? Why has it got windows where they are and not where they're not, sort of thing? All those kind of questions. But as a, a worship space, it worked really, really well because you can have a lot of people who are yet very close to each other, so you get a real sense and feeling of intimacy, which I thought was amazing. And the acoustics tremendous as well so once you started to do something it, it, it all started to make sense but when you first walked in you just think oh that's interesting why <laughs> god comes down to his people in the sense the way we sort of come into the chapel and come down um, that god brings light gives light god is light um, because the entrance especially if the door's not open and it's not a sunny morning, the entrance hall is quite dark and then you come into the chapel and it's always quite light. Well it is presence, God's presence, so you can feel it very quickly and to, to worship, um, it feels very calming, very, very peaceful. So when we received the brief and I went back to my team at the office and we were sitting around a table and we were beginning to stir up ideas for how we might design the chapel, the first thing I did was to read this poem to the group of architects around and say, let's make a project about this. And when we did the competition interview and we were speaking in front of a panel of eight or nine people who were judging us, I asked my project architect to read the poem to them. And so if you don't mind, I'll read it to you now. It's written by the Irish poet Seamus Heaney. And he wrote it, he, he, he read it out when he received the Nobel Prize. And what's amazing about it is that it presents itself as a translation from the annals of Tom MacNoise, which are from the Middle Ages. And the monks of Tom MacNoise would keep annals. And they would describe harvests, storms, fires, moments of succession, ceremonies and events. But they also describe this. The annals say, and the monks of Conmac Noise were all at prayers inside the oratory, a ship appeared above them in the air. The anchor dragged along behind so deep it hooked itself into the altar rails, and then, as the big hull rocked to a standstill, a crewman shinned and dra grappled down the rope and struggled to release it, but in vain. This man can't bear our life here and will drown, the abbot said, unless we help him. So they did. The freed ship sailed, and the man climbed back out of the marvellous as he had known it. <laughs> 
Yes, what will historians make of a building from the early 21st century built at a time of religious decline, the Church of England, the numbers are going down, uh, uh, all the uh, finances of the church are under threat. I think what it comes over as is something of a bold statement for the future, probably. Uh, it will say something about how a place understood its needs at the time, because any church always does. It's always a historical statement. Uh, of religion, uh, but I think it would also be wanting to affirm the importance of prayer uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, which is not necessarily something that uh, has been the main focus of what the church has uh, tried to uh, emphasise in periods of decline, a focus, a return to the centre. I hope that's what people will think we were doing in the years to come. They might be simply surprised that we had the audacity to build such a large building uh, at the end of the Church of England's life, but uh, we hope and we pray that that's not the case. A week after the visit to Cudston, our three experts gathered at St Mary's to further discuss the possible design brief Thomas Hardwick may have had for St Mary's. They gave a public lecture which had the title, We Have the Answer. But what was the question? Uh, one of the interesting things I think about St Mary's is that it's almost unique in being built during that period of turmoil and unrest at the beginning of uh, the just following on from the French Revolution. Uh, at that time, there's an awful lot of people who are uh, uh, trying to draw on those revolutionary ideas and see whether they might make some sort of sense in this country as well. Uh, and in lots of ways they're drawing on ideas of universal reason, trying to understand uh, something about how they can use their powers of criticism uh, to address the structures of society. Christianity, for the people who built this building, was something that had a rational structure and a rational order, and this church in many ways represents something of that. All of us have got to relate the questions, the same sorts of questions, that the people who designed these churches were asking themselves. How does the architecture relate to the mission of the church and what's the relationship between the mission of the church to the wider community and the wider world? So how does our church relate to the past and how does our church relate to the future? Are we trying to live out a rather imaginary past that's long since gone. That, I think, is one of the great criticisms that you can find of Victorian church architecture. They were really making it up in a society where it may not really have fitted. And the classical past of the 18th century might have been just as difficult to uh, uh, recreate. What does it mean to be a rural temple? What kind of God are we worshipping? And I guess if we're trying to think through about the use of this sort of building into the future, what we've got to do is to think about the mission of the church and how that church connects uh, with the wider society and how we do that in a time when people are no longer compelled to come to church as they might have been in 1790, but people have to be awakened in trying to understand what a church is all about in the first place and to show that it has something to offer people uh, that gives them a sense of uh, greatness and a sense of focus upwards and outwards on their maker and on trying to understand more of who they are in relation to that maker. Can we reimagine ourselves back into a conversation between architect and patron and what that conversation may have been like? I suppose it started with the need to, with Dr. Glass saying, I want a larger congregation. I want more space. And I think even the number was set at 600, 500 or 600, which seemed pretty optimistic for the small church that was there. And so when Hardwick was trying to, I don't think there are any drawings surviving, but trying to enlarge by rebuilding the nave, he would have struggled even if he hadn't decided that the, the chancel had to go as well. Um, but on a practical level, I guess that's how it began. Mm -hmm. Because the, the parish was already how many, 800, 900 people strong. So it, 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 was, it was an urgent problem to, get the, to make a bigger church. 
um, I'm not sure how, how in terms of a, lit, of a liturgical brief would have come in at that stage. I think probably at that sort of time in the late 18th century, the Church of England was very much set in how it did things. And so this church isn't particularly different in appearance from a lot of um, uh, London churches at much the same sort of time or the churches that came just afterwards after the Battle of Waterloo, where mm. there's a huge new building, uh, church building scheme, uh, because the city begins to grow very rapidly. And in some senses, this is the beginning of the rapid growth uh, of, city, of, the, of the city of London and in parishes in and around London as well. There's an interesting thing. I don't know how it would relate to this church, because I know a little bit more about uh, Hardwick's church in Marylebone, but it was originally an estate church. Uh, it was conceived of originally as a mm. state church and had a four-columned Ionic portico. And then there was a proposal that it would be turned into a parish church. And because of that, there was a further act that had to be passed mm. to allow it to be a parish mm. church. And the same church on the same spot was redesigned with the mm. six-columned Corinthian portico mm. and a larger belfry. And so there was a kind of there was an expectation that came with, mm. and it reminded me slightly of the great tradition in China in the 12th century that the, of Chinese halls, and you gave halls a rank, and whatever the rank was, it was like a military rank, mm. any carpenter in the country could then build that hall. All you had to say, I need a 12th rank hall, and yes, it could be it built. Done, and I yes. suspect that there was something about churches that were similar at the time, that given the status of the grandeur um, or the, 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 the intended function of the church, there was then a typology which came with design details, the orders you would use, and many other things that, 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 that would be naturally intuited from the status it would have had in terms of its basic description. And I don't think it would have been so much a kind of a detailed client consultation with the donor saying, oh, I want this and I'd like it to do that. I think it would be, can we have church type B you know, on, on the site in that position? And then many of the other things would have come from the architectural tradition from which he was working and custom and practice at the time that would have understood it was that kind of church. And again for the pews is that you financed your church by renting out the pews, so yeah, yeah. Uh, you needed to have a lot of pews in order that everybody could rent one, uh, and that's how you made your money and could pay for the ministry. So it's a very practical thing to have lots of pews. And, but you broaden it out democratically or, or more liberally by having the upper pews for the servants and the young mm -hmm. people. I think here it was women on the south side, women and girls on the south gallery and boys and men on the north gallery. Mm -hmm. But that, whether that was part of the brief, I don't know, but it certainly recorded at the, at the inaugural service when the bishop came, that that's where they were put. Thinking about this church in light of our visit to the Edward King Chapel in Cudston, are there any similarities or differences or lessons that we can draw between these two sacred spaces? I think this building is a public work. I think it's, there's a function of architecture which is that it's always an act of public reasoning. It's always an act of public representation. I see this as being the established church built for an established family within the tradition of public life in the city. And it is a representation of public propriety. Primarily that's what it is. And it's an elegant manifestation of that. But what it's telling you is, the message this is giving you is that the world is an ordered place. The architecture is ordered, society is ordered, government and the church are ordered, and you will find your place in this order. And if your place in that order within the box of the pew gives you privacy, I don't deny that privacy, but I think that it's an outcome of other things which have primacy. When we had the brief for Cudston, the brief we were given was much more about subjective experience. If you asked me, was subjective experience central to the architecture of this building, I would say not. I would say this is a, this, it's, a, it's a public building. It's about public representations. I think Cudston was about a number of overlapping kinds of subjectivity. And it was about what people, there was much more emphasis in what we were asked to do in what people felt, the sense of their subjective experience in that moment in the place, the idea of being in community, the idea of being alone. The, 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 these are the things that were discussed back and forth between us and uh, our clients. Now you asked me, did Thomas Hardwick have that conversation with his donors? And I can't tell you what conversation he had, but I very much doubt that that was the conversation because I don't think that was the time. And my own feeling is that it's so important to think about the community and the context in which the church sits. 
uh, Edward King Chapel was very much related to the particular community that drew up the brief and uses the building. It's a theological college and a small sisterhood. Uh, and those have particular needs for a religious building, for a church building. Whereas a parish needs to think again every generation about what its needs are for its mm. church buildings. And you've got two different, very different church buildings within one parish. Mm. And to try and work out what the vocation of each of those buildings and how that serves the parish and the wider community is absolutely central. So to work out what is the context of 21st century Wanstead, which is extraordinarily different from the context of 1790. Mm. Uh, so things have changed beyond mm. recognition in those 230 years or whatever. A building as an object in itself is not something that can embody the idea of God in itself. If I go back to Schwartz, the architect who wrote so well about the liturgy, he says the Christian community are the embodiment of God. And I think of architecture as being primarily a framing activity. The Christian community come and worship in this place. They make it a sacred space. It is their practice that, 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 that consecrates this place. It is they coming together to worship together who make this place, who make this place sacred and, and, and an, an embodiment of God. Unless it's a place for Christian worship, unless it's revived by Christian worship on a regular basis, is just another object in the world. It needs to be lived in order to be an embodiment of God.